Hi team, and welcome back to e-commerce experts. Thank you ever so much for joining us this week. We have the wonderful Lucas, CEO and founder of Lick Home. And if you haven't heard of Lick, as some of our own staff haven't, they are a paint brand that is absolutely tearing up the home decor industry. It's so fascinating the way they've gone from zero to 250,000 followers and a baby brand that's not even two years old that's already expanding across Europe. He lets us into some of their secrets as to what their focus has been in terms of growing that community uh, and what their focus was when they came to disrupt the market, because that's exactly what they've done. They've taken a marketplace that's rather boring and underserved digitally and created a customer centric digital experience. So I hope you enjoy this one as much as I did. Without further ado, here he is. Well, let me firstly say thank you ever so much, Lucas, for joining us today. I think it'll be a really interesting episode, particularly because two of our prior founders have said the e-commerce brand that they admire the most right now is Lick. That's very kind. Thank you very much. And I guess the biggest question is why did you take out to disrupt the home decor market out of all the markets possible? So, yeah, I started in finance. I spent five years in hedge fund and then I've been working startup since. And the last business I worked at was a company called Airtasker, which was a marketplace to find handymen. That was out of Australia and actually IPO'd this year. And I was the first hire outside of Australia. Amazing experience, but it exposed me and my co-founder, Sam, who I met there to decorating. Very aware that we had this enormous industry, 100 million industry in North America and Europe. Yet only 4% of it was bought online. So we thought we were you know, in a good place to do that, given our experience. As we got close to launch, we really became very aware of how big the customer problem was, which was the fact that decorators, and we call anyone a decorator who wants to engage with colors and transform their home, whether they pick up a paintbrush or not. Really, they broadly felt unsupported and lacked confidence to make the decisions and to decorate and thought that if we made our sole focus on solving that and we were in a really great place to build a you know, fantastic business. So it's definitely changed along the journey, but it was that exposure to decorating the industry in my last company I worked at. Interesting. And so, okay, you've got this hundred million pound industry and you think, right, oh, we need to disrupt it. We need to change it. Where do you start? Once you realise that was where you were going to go, what was the first thing that you thought, this is what we've got to fix? Yeah, I mean, this is an obvious answer, I think. The first thing you do is just start a business plan. So we gave ourselves a set amount of time and thought, let's do a business plan. Let's see if we can raise money. We felt that it was important to raise money to really solve the customer problem and really differentiate with the customer experience and the brand. So we felt we needed the capital to do that. So for us, it was a bit black and white. If we raise money, we'd give it a go. And if not, we would go and get jobs. So we set about building the business plan. And, and that's a really valuable experience because you have to do a slide on competitive analysis. So you have to research the market and you have to do a slide on market size. So you have to understand the market and a problem slide, a solution slide. And you then had to create a product slide. So you had to go and create some products. And we managed to raise a seed round of £850,000 from some really great angels and then set about building the business. But even though we're a year and a half old, it's sort of very different business already to what we set about in my kitchen a couple of years ago. Of course, you started in a kitchen, like all great businesses. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and, and it's interesting that you say it's obvious you started from a, a business plan, but actually it's quite a finance approach. It's that thought out process of going through everything. And there's a lot of businesses that we speak to that really don't have a plan, probably still to this day, because they've started out of pure love or they've started out of creating a product by accident. So I, I like that you actually approached it in a very logical and thorough perspective. I think it's a secure way to start, as you say, ensure that you cover all of the important things that you need to know about the market and the industry in order to be able to disrupt it fully. I mean, building a business is, is extremely daunting. So you definitely need structure. Because I started in finance, I always got put into kind of fundraising and the kind of commercial roles in startups. So I was very aware of how to structure an investment tech and how that process worked. So we just started that process. And even now, we're just focusing on 
our OKRs or key objectives that we need to do. If we took a step, step back and realized what we're actually trying to do on a global scale, I think we'd have a panic attack. Making sure you have a structure was always really important for us. I love the honesty. And so in terms of the consumer change that you were looking to create, you were looking to shift their behavior online, but was this a specific part of that consumer journey that you were looking to disrupt? Yeah, originally it was to make decorating easy. So we wanted to simplify everything in terms of number of colors. When you walk through the aisle of a hardware store, there's too much colors, there's too many specifications. I think we realized decorating is not necessarily easy. And actually we wanted to make sure, and the customer problem really was unsupported. They had a style that they wanted to achieve. We're there to help them achieve that and guide them through the process. So that was really the customer problem that we are solving now, but not necessarily the one where we set out to solve. So at, at the beginning, it was, it was curating the colors, simplifying the product range. And now it's everything from the content we create, the way our community supports each other, the way we use our video color specialists, the way we decorate success team support our customers, the way we create our tools to ensure the best finish. It's not one USP, it's really support throughout the whole journey. And that was alien in the industry. The original user behavior is you go on Pinterest on Instagram, you look at some content, you get a look that you want to achieve, and then you walk around the hardware stores trying to see how you can achieve that look without any support. Huge difference to what what we're trying to do on a day-to-day. Absolutely. And I saw somewhere that you've now also planted uh, the equivalent of 72 football fields worth of trees. I'm sure it's grown since that report came out, but is that sustainability piece, how are you tackling it and how important is it? It's really important. I mean, the truth is that Sam and I just wanted to build a business the right way. That's across many reasons. So we wanted to have not just reduce the impact that it would have on the environment, but have positive impact, build it with nice people, with nice investors, try and create diversity in the workplace and enjoy the journey as well. Sustainability was a massive driver. Making sure that there was a commercial alignment to that. that if you can create some commercial alignment, then, then that can generate even more power and value. But it was very hard early doors, and we wanted to be very honest about that. So originally, we didn't have a localized supply chain, and, and we thought we were using sustainable products. But as we dug deeper, we became aware that it wasn't optimum. And as a small business at the time, it was really hard to influence those supply chains. And we've come a huge way since then, but we've got a, you know, a, a long way to go. And it's definitely a, a journey. But I'm really proud of the plastic we've taken out of the ocean, um, 300,000 plastic bottles from the ocean and planted, I think, 90 football pitches, doing a big audit on our carbon and working out how we can not just offset, but how we can become net zero. And we continue to localize our supply chain. And that's been a, a massive result and use of recyclable packaging. We just also hired a head of sustainability who's about to join the business, which is a big role for a business this young. And it kind of shows our intent, but it's still a, a huge amount of work to do. What struck me so far is how much you've listed that you're doing. For a business that's not even two years old? Yeah, <laughs> we're definitely busy. When we launched, we obviously launched in a time when decorating was in demand. And that meant we could grow fast. That meant we could hire people quickly and, and talented people. And it's those people that are, are delivering this and are shaping the business. Our vision is constantly changing and based on the great talent that's being brought into the business and the way they're taking the business and sustainability is something that everyone across the business is passionate about which means every touch point whether it's supply chain or product development or content or you know branding everyone wants to have a positive impact so it means the traction that we can get in that area is is pretty powerful I mean, uh, short of like Jennifer Aniston and Beyonce, I've definitely never heard of a business go from zero followers to quarter of a million on Instagram in under a year. It, it's unheard of, particularly for a traditionally boring, dare I say it, an industry that is it's paint at the end of the day. And actually we had Jazz from Eve Sleep on here a few weeks ago. It's the same transition as mattresses it's taking a boring concept and bringing it into the consumer world in a way that consumers want to hear it was instagram and that community following always going to be a pivotal part of 
transforming the consumer journey online? So I think we took inspiration from businesses like Glossier that were creating brands that were speaking to their customers on an individual level. And we knew that that was going to be how this trend was going to continue. And that was going to be important for us to build the brands. But as we started to engage with our community, we really found the power of them shaping the brand, shaping the products and supporting each other. So, you know, most of the content you're seeing on our site, on our social is, is community created, which means that content that are inspiring and educating others. And as we launch into Europe and expand in new markets, if someone wants a Scandinavian look, they're getting content from talented decorators. So that sort of is compounding. And I think the power of that community, we probably underestimated at first. We knew it had to be the driver of our business, but the way they support each other has been so phenomenal and has been a big factor of our growth, especially in Instagram. So we're definitely socially built and socially led business. Uh, And we'd always wanted to be. And so how do you nurture that? Because as you say, the majority of it is customer content, but how do you promote and encourage that behavior? Because I'm sure there's a, you know, a hundred small businesses out there that would love to have a similar community. How did you tackle it? We had friends of mine who were decorating their home and their content was very real and relatable. So their house wasn't some sort of beautiful, unattainable property. It was a real home that you can imagine living in and, and they were relatable and they would decorating and they were spilling paint and they were drinking a glass of wine and playing with their dog while they were decorating. And it it was very different from the previous content that you'd seen in the category, which was mostly kind of unattainable, beautiful properties. And I think that was where we started to see the power of that content and encourage other people to share their experience and the results of their decorating. And that is a kind of flywheel that started. So it's amazing that the community needs little incentive to share their results they're decorating to inspire others and support others. So it all kind of started from those early requests from friends and family to, to send in their videos for us to repost. Amazing. I like that you used them. Absolutely. You've got to get them behind. You know, it's it's one thing if someone agrees to, if one of your family members says, give me the link, I'll follow you. But it's another thing to actually film for you. Not to mention how exhausting it is actually painting. I'm impressed that they committed because whether you're in lockdown or not, I always underestimate painting. It's that thing that you start and you think this will be lovely. <laughs> and then you're like, oh God, I haven't finished. Partly because 80% of the job is preparation and, and the more focus you put in, the better results are. So I think that's always something that people underestimate. But then in many ways, it's, it's one of the most sort of impactful ways you can transform your home, bringing color into a room, a relatively inexpensive amount and a bit of effort over the weekend. You can have a really big impact on your home, I think. I think that's what happened in lockdown. People have been incentivized because they've been bored at home or they're on Zoom and they want to showcase their home. I like the way we both say this from a full white rooms. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Of colour can make a huge difference. And so this is your first office? Yeah, so we had an office, which was a very small office in Vauxhall, which we grew out of quickly. But we, because we launched a lockdown, we've been remote entirely since then so we never really use that office we're down in Brixton and we've got a great office that people can use as and when they want but we we remain remote first we have a team in France and Ireland I think as lot lifted people wanted to spend more time together and working together and collaborating it's been wonderful to have a space for people to come to It's quite lucky from that perspective in terms of all of your contracts and negotiations and staff has all been dealt with with pandemic first almost, you know, with that remote first approach, because that's what the new normal is for the majority of businesses. You had that advantage. You hadn't just taken the lease out on a really expensive office, which was then never going to get used. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's all we've known. So it, it's building the, building the business in, in this way. It's been a really interesting, the culture that we managed to create all through Zoom has been fantastic. Amazing to see what you can do. What's your top bits of advice then? What do you think of the things you did right? I think the people we've got right, and that's everything really. Mm-hmm. The business is just a, a combination of the people that work for it and your customers. And we've hired some really talented people and given them the ownership do their roles and reward everyone's got shares in the business limited holiday and and flexible working and trying to create an environment where 
if they work at their best and they're incentivized and it's a place they want to be and making sure we're bringing in the best talent. And I think that's where we're most proud of, really. I, that is an achievement, particularly in the current market. It's not an easy market for anybody to be recruiting right now. So your people first approach has obviously paid off. Yeah, because obviously when we launched, there was so much uncertainty and there was a lot of movements in people leaving leaving roles, some by choice and some unfortunately because their businesses were negatively impacted. Now it's flipped the other way. It's obviously um, there's a huge demand as businesses are invested in you know, online first, which means a certain pool of talents become extremely relatively small, Valuable. I guess. So just back to the product for a second. You, um, you started out with paint. You're now doing wallpaper as well and you're doing other parts. Do you plan on continue vertically spreading yourselves from a, a product perspective or are you now focusing in on the international growth before you look at new product development? Yeah, we've rebased. So we were moving into other categories, but that's changed as we've internationalized. So now our our, our We've refocused and are focusing the business to almost simplify the business a bit in order to scale into new markets. And the opportunity in this category, one is so vast, but also getting that, solving that customer problem in this category is important for us to lead with. So really our focus is our our core categories of wallpaper, paint, and all the tools you need to decorate. And our focus is moving towards internationalization. Exciting. Very. It must feel like an exciting time. Like now you've got, hopefully now you've got your supply chain issues sorted. Now you've got the logistical elements of it that you can now grow to that point where you can expand internationally. Dare I ask, have you started with Europe or have you left Europe? So we've started with Europe because of the way our supply chain works. We can just extend the supply chain into markets in Europe. And, and we've been spending the last month or so AP testing different markets to see which market makes sense to prioritize and localize. And obviously, Europe is very challenging and a lot of businesses haven't succeeded in, in expanding because of the complexities with language and culture. It's our focus. But it's been a really interesting time because of our supply chain hit a kind of max we had to reinvest in the supply chain and innovate in that area, which has recently come online. So that was a sort of six month period. But it meant we had to, we forced ourselves to not look at short term numbers because, you know, we were limiting our growth because of our restrictions. So we started focusing on what we needed to, to do in six months, 12 months time. And a lot of those big investments are coming online now, like internationalization. We've just launched Lip Pro, which is for trade. This is a great time for us to see those sort of investments starting to, to, to go live. Head of PPC, Jeremy, will be so reassured to hear that you said, along with expanding internationally, you want to then localize. Because we just know it's like we know how important it is to localize in order to hit all markets, not just the, all the markets in Europe, but the amount of hypothetically Italian ads that then lead to English websites is, is, is painful. So it, it's reassuring that that's an important one on your list. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that was the first learning we had. We did a number of tests running English ads, running localized language ads, taking to English sites, local sites. And it was clear and very obvious that whatever market in Europe you chose, there needed to be a high level of localization. So then for us, it it moves to focus. You, You can't localize every European market. So it's deciding which makes sense, which where your brand and your product resonate with, which is in phase we're in now. And so do you have a testing culture then? Because you've mentioned it a few times now. Is it very much how your business is growing based off A-B testing everything? Yes and no. So we we wanted to really focus on building that kind of growth marketing and A-B test framework from day one. And we wanted to almost culturally make it a a big part of the business. And I think we've done a great job in that. But I think when you're at this stage, there are big bets you can make that you need to lean into and, and potentially not test like internationalization versus just you know doing site CRO. So it's that balance of the two. You know, a great example is building this business. We we had conviction in, in what we needed to do to launch, where you could have taken a much purer A B test approach to testing this category. So I think it's a balance of, of the two, but it's definitely important. And so you've now just embarked on the exciting journey of partnerships. You've got the collaboration with Made.com. 
Is that something you perceive as a new customer acquisition tool or is it something you perceive as an ongoing alignment of better businesses, I guess, and, and correct business practice? Yeah, I think from day one, we wanted to be a, you know, a modern home decor brand. So for that potentially multi-vertical, multi-channel, omni-channel, I think we just want to build the business a smart way and build you know, a modern business. So a multi-channel approach to customer acquisition had to be the case from day one. Uh, and Mate.com is a great example of that, but also there's some fantastic alignment with their brands. You know, they built a great brand in Europe, so it's great to you know, also build trust with our customer base and through that partnership. I mean, your values obviously align. It's very clear for, for all to see. I actually went to a hotel last weekend and it was really interesting. It was a very nicely designed hotel and they had the colour strips on the wall of what paint was used by... Farrow and Bull, I have to say. I've never seen that before, whereby you think, oh yeah, I like the design of this room. I wonder what colour it is. I don't know whether they've been asked so many times or whether Farrow and Bull sponsored the walls, but I just thought it was a very interesting move to actually stick. This is the name of the paint and here's where you can buy it kind of thing on, on yeah, the Yeah, very cool. It's tricky with paint. You don't go, it's unbranded, I guess, once it's on the wall. So when you go to someone's home or see a wall, you don't necessarily know which brand it came from. So I think that's a you know, kind of way to do it. But as someone who's about to move house, imagine how helpful that would be if on the corner of every wall it said what paint it was so that when you went to get new ones and top it up, you actually knew rather than getting another colour and or it being the wrong colour white. And it and it, just, it would make life a lot easier if there were those little yeah. QR code or something just stuck in the corner so that you could get it. Yeah, absolutely. So we always end the podcast with the same question. This is where your brand came up, actually. So it'll be interesting to hear what you now come up and say, except for Lick. What's your favorite e-commerce brand in the industry right now? Good question. So many to, to choose from. And some fantastic brands coming out of the UK, you know, like Papier, like Bloomer Wild. I think for me, it, Gymshark has to be one of the leading brands that I admire. And I'm sure I'm not the first person to say that. I think the way he's built this business to such scale and so quickly bootstrapped has to be admired. You know, his journey as well, moving away from CEO and then coming back to CEO, I, I also, you know, admire the sort of strategic maturity of that. But the way they've engaged their audience and the loyalty of their audience in a category that probably at the time many people didn't really look at is amazing. So I think... Everything they do, I seem to admire and like. That's going to be one of, if not my favourite brand at the moment. I obviously completely agree, and not just because I spoke to Noel a couple of weeks ago, but definitely the the Black Friday Happy Birthday Gymshark campaign has had me in stitches. I think it was a very successful social stunt, and I think they are masters of it at the moment. It will be interesting to see what the next business is that can compete with that. Because at the moment, yeah. there is nobody else on their level. Um, well, look, I really appreciate that you are in your peak and that you've given us your time in order to talk to us today. Thank you ever so much for joining us, Lucas. I really, really appreciate it. Pleasure. Thank you very much for inviting me.